This program is underwritten in part by... VINGN is a proud supporter of this League of Women Voters program. VINGN interconnects the U.S. Virgin Islands and connects the VI to the world with fiber optics. Find out more at VINGN.com. AARP Virgin Islands. Cost You Less is a proud supporter of the Virgin Islands public broadcasting system. They currently have over 200 employees between St. Thomas and St. Croix and have been part of the local community for over 20 years. Cost You Less carries perishables, groceries, and general merchandise. For more information, visit their website at costyouless.com. Market Square East, St. Thomas, and Sign Farm, St. Croix. and viewers like you. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of WTJX, its board, staff, or underwriters. Good day, and welcome to the League of Women Voters Referendum Town Hall, a virtual program sponsored and organized for the purpose of helping to educate the public regarding the referendum question that will appear on the November ballot that asks the voter whether or not <clears throat> the legislature should convene a constitutional convention to adopt the revised Organic Act or portions of it as the Constitution for the USVI. When the bill was passed in the legislature, the League was asked to conduct a public education program to help voters make an informed choice. Today's program reflects the League's commitment to that request. I'm Dr. Gwen Marie Molinar, president of the League of Women Voters, and I will serve as moderator for the program. We've gathered a group of individuals who I think you will agree are a blue ribbon panel. They have studied or written extensively on the matter of the constitution and political maturity. The League has tried to present a balanced representation of those who can speak on both sides of the question with facts and significant information. Here uh, on our panel, starting with the author of the referendum is Senator Myron Jackson, we welcome you. Uh, Senator Jackson, we also welcome one of the co-sponsors of the bill, Senator Alicia Barnes. Both of them are members of the 33rd legislature. Other panelists are Mr. Sele Adeyeme, an educator and voice often heard on radio on political and cultural significance to Virgin Islanders. Dr. Carlisle Corbin, Corbin, political scientist, educator, advisor to five governors on foreign relations, a prolific author uh, on, on these issues. Dr. Corbin was an advisor to five governors and he's calling in today from Guam from tomorrow. Uh, it's the wee hours of tomorrow in Guam. Dr. Corbin, thank you so much for being here. Professor Gerard Emanuel, a UVI faculty member, who served as a delegate and secretary to the Fifth Constitutional Convention. Dr. Lois Haptis, a well-known educator and cultural activist, member of the UVI Board of Trustees. She was also a delegate to the Fifth Constitutional Convention. So we have four members of our panel today who were members of the Fifth Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> we have uh, Dr. Malik Sekou, a political scientist and UVI faculty member who has served in several leadership roles in efforts to bring us toward greater political maturity. And finally, Dr. Hadia Sewer, a rising star. Uh, she's a young political activist of St. John, demonstrating leadership, especially among the young adults of our community. She's a research fellow at Stanford University. So 
there you have our Blue Ribbon panel with whom we're going to spend the next two hours in what should be a stimulating discussion. Your questions will be submitted. Your questions can be submitted anytime during the program and the panelists will respond in the second part of the program. You can call in your number, your questions to a number that will be flashed across the screen. And if you're a Facebook user, you can send your post to WTJX Facebook or the League of Women Voters Facebook LWVVI. So let's begin with our discussion. And we'll start with you, Senator Jackson, first. Could you tell us how you came about this idea and um, why you decided to indicate the Revised Organic Act and who are your co-sponsors for the bill? Senator Jackson? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Molinar, and thank you for this forum, the League of Women Voters, and all of the other participants, and good afternoon to those viewing. Uh, the bill, which is bill number 330292, as introduced uh, to the 33rd legislature, is a bill that I've had for several years, and one of the tasks that I considered uh, as a new senator into the legislative body was to introduce legislation to have a status referendum and a constitutional um, and a constitution forum. So those two particular measures have carried over the years. Uh, most recently with the League of Women Voters engagement, I think it was last year, the discussion of status and a constitution came up and I had already had the bill. And I decided to uh, push the matter and thus 330292 was created which is an act providing for a referendum vote on convening a constitutional convention to consider adopting the Revised Organic Act of the Virgin Islands or portions of it as the Constitution of the Virgin Islands. Recognizing that we've had five constitutional conventions and most recently with the COVID-19 pandemic in the territory specifically and the um, issue relating to the Virgin Islands Legislature or the Legislature of the Virgin Islands, uh, its members being able to vote remotely even brought the, the issue more to the forefront because of course uh, it refers to the Organic Act and that likewise um, the uh, sessions have to be in the capital or shall be in the capital, which is Charlotte Amaria and that likewise we were not able to remote vote um, rem vote remotely while other legislative bodies uh, in the United States and around the world have decided to do so to protect its members and its staff and the community. So it has been enacted and joining uh, as a co-sponsor who is with us today is Senator Alicia Barnes and uh, you can hear from her as well as why she felt it important to join as a co-sponsor to this particular measure. Thank you. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Senator Barnes in a little while. But what I want to do is, is to move on to a question that I think needs to be clarified. And we need to have a definition. Everyone is using the term organic act, they're using the term constitution, they're using the term political status. And I think people conflate uh, the, the meanings of all three. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Corbin, uh, since you've written on this extensively, can you please clarify the definitions? What is an organic act? What is a constitution? Is it different? And, what, and how do they relate to political status? Dr. Corbin. During the time that I was in government, uh, part of my role was to be the territory's representative to the United Nations, and we dealt with the decolonization issue and the concerns about the constitution and political status 
uh, were addressed at that time for all U.S. territories. Now, if you, if you take the Constitution, it's essentially a document that organizes the basic functions of government, number of senators, uh, districting, Bill of Rights, et cetera. Uh, federal, it's a federal law that, uh, that in case of the Revised Organic Act, which serves in place of our Constitution, it's not our Constitution, but it serves in place of it. Um, we, we know that uh, the broader picture is the question of political status. This deals with our relations with the United States and with the world. Uh, as a territory, Washington uh, currently has total authority to apply laws to us, uh, even as we may not agree. And we can look at some examples of this most recently regarding cockfighting, uh, banning uh, the issues of the excise taxes, which we are now, there's questions as to whether we can collect them, issues of co con, uh, collecting uh, revenue on the rum excise taxes, but particularly the oil excise taxes, which does not appear so far to be available to us. This is all a function of the status, uh, which provides us with limited power to make decisions uh, that affect us. Now, Constitution or the adoption of the Organic Act is not designed to deal with those fundamental questions. Again, it's merely designed to address the, in, the internal makings of our government. Uh, we have uh, submitted, as you noted, uh, five, in fact, I think um, Senator Jackson noted that there were five uh, attempts to draft the Constitution. And I think one of the things that we found each time was that certain powers that we, we, we require cannot be granted under the current status. And I think in 1979, Guam has indeed attempted to uh, their own Constitution and rejected it overwhelmingly, 82%, I believe, on the basis of the fact that they did not, it did not provide them with the power that they needed. Um, we, of course, also in 1982 had a referendum, uh, those of us who go back that far, who remember that the uh, voters decided to uh, deal with status first and, and deal with the Constitution on the basis of the chosen status. Uh, of course, we are not following that advice at this moment. Uh, and since we did the Fifth Constitution, uh, we did also deviate from that uh, recommendation. Now, in, in November, Puerto Rico will, will be having a referendum on one of the permanent options, which is uh, that of U.S. statehood. Guam and Northern Marianas are currently working on a uh, status referenda, which will address the three options that are legitimate and recognized under international law, which are independence, free association, and integration. So while they are broadening their scope, uh, we are, we're not broadening ours. I think we may be narrowing our scope a bit. Uh, the question before us is whether to adopt the Revised Organic Act as a territorial constitution. Uh, if we decide to do so, then we may be uh, running the risk of legitimizing our current status, and that might not be in our interest to do that. This is what the Revised Organic Act represents, essentially that of political inequality. So we need to uh, bear that in mind as we proceed. Now, in this November uh, marks the 50th anniversary of our first election for governor. Uh, after 50 years, I think we, the, those governors who came before might, uh, might have us uh, do something a little bit differently. And that's, I, with that, I thank you. Great, thank you. So let me ask uh, Dr. Sewer. Dr. Sewer, we are planning to write a constitution and we have been trying to do that before political status. Does it make a difference? Um, I think it's sort of hinted to by uh, Dr. Corbin, but is there a flaw in, in doing it this way or can one do it with impunity? Can one write a constitution uh, without necessarily having uh, a political status? What are, your, what are your views on that? Dr. Seward? Yes, Dr. Molinar, thank you for this particular question, especially uh, given the fact that for many of us, we do have questions about whether or not it may pose any additional challenges if we prioritize constitution at this time and delay our attempt to address status. And at this time, I believe very strongly that constitutional development is essential. However, it's not necessarily a substitute for decolonization. And in short, if we think about our political status as existing under the plenary power of 
Congress, we might find that ratifying a constitution before we address the issue of status may cement some of the more troublesome aspects of the plenary power of Congress over us as colonized people. And so specifically, when we look at some of the narratives around the first five constitutional conventions of the Virgin Islands, we recognize that Congress currently holds the right to ratify, amend, or reject our proposed constitutions as territories of the United States of America. And when we look at some of the contentious clauses in the fifth constitutional convention's proposed constitution, for example, I argue that many of the challenges in moving the constitution forward are actually centered around debates around questions of self-determination and sovereignty, and that this actually lies at some of the earlier quote-unquote failures in our attempts to ratify a constitution for the Virgin Islands. And so if we understand constitutional development to be about political visioning, which of course includes defining who we are as a people and how our government ought to be structured, uh, as a people with histories of enslavement who are currently experiencing colonialism, for us, constitutional development is also about a desire for freedom. And so the Department of Justice said many things about our last proposed constitution. In part, they noted that it doesn't adequately recognize U.S. sovereignty over the Virgin Islands, that it also defines and favors certain segments of the population, that the proposed constitutions of the past violate the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S., and has imprecise language and certain provisions among other critiques. However, to quote Dr. Corbin, uh, attempts to confer certain powers in our proposed constitution are not inherently or readily possible under our current political status. And so when we say that we want to convene another constitutional convention where we might adopt the revised organic act in part or in full, in part what I hear is saying is that we are attempting to create a constitution that we deem to be passable by the contiguous United States at this particular time. And so a part of the question that I have for us is will this constitution reflect our right to self-definition? And will this constitution articulate and give legal power to our second class citizenship and current colonial status? And so if we're to use Puerto Rico as an example, um, given that they passed the constitution in 1952, we can learn some things about what happens when one might prioritize the constitution before status. And Gordon Lewis was a prominent political thinker, especially on Caribbean politics, once noted that he found the Puerto Rican constitution to be what he called colonialism by choice. And that in the long term, this can lead to some confusion in local, regional, and international bodies regarding the political status of the Virgin Islands, because essentially it doesn't necessarily eradicate the plenary of power of Congress over us. It doesn't give us control over our borders or abolish federal oversight. And so in essence, we may remain second class citizens in an American colony. And to quote, you know, my grandmother, we might find ourselves in a position where we're doing double work because once the issue of status is decided, we will still have to double back and craft a constitution that speaks very clearly to our sense of self-definition and our desire for what we understand to be a free political future for us as Islanders. Thank you. Well, it seems to me, thank you for those uh, responses. Um, Miami. It seems to me that what both uh, Dr. Sewer and Dr. Corbin are saying is that we have been conflating both a uh, constitution, which is essentially a document that tells you how the government is organized to run and the daily uh, business of government with um, self-determination, uh, which is what uh, political uh, status is about. So, um, and perhaps because we had included elements of <coughs> political status in our local constitutions, it, uh, they, they were rejected. So what is your take on that, um, Professor? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to the uh, fellow presenters and to the viewers. And I also like to, I would also like to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and uh, WTJX for this program. Well, 
uh, unquestionably, yes, sequence is critical. Uh, in fact, it's almost like oxygen, what oxygen is to human beings. Uh, you know, we have written, as you said, five constitution, constitutional drafts. And I, I want to suggest that the reason we have never successfully uh, achieved approval of those constitutional drafts is because, uh, <clears throat> because we have been ignoring political status. Political status is like, is like a, a, a plan for building a house. Normally, your political status, if you look at peoples around the world, political status comes before you write a constitution. And we can just look at our own unique history in the Virgin Islands. If you take uh, what would become the Danish West Indies beginning between 1666, 1672, you'll find what Denmark did. Denmark um, determined the political status of the Danish West Indies. It was a non-self-governing colony or territory, right? And then later on, subsequently, it wrote the uh, uh, what some people call uh, first constitution, 1852 colonial law, right? You take the United States, the English colonies, right? They declare their political status, independence, on July 4th, 1776. And then soon after that, the following year, they will write their first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Subsequently, they will write the U.S. Constitution. So that's the procedure. It is the norm. And um, because we have not done so, we have uh, ended up in failure in trying to write a constitution. Uh, the political status set uh, boundaries, it set the parameters, it set direction. You know, without that, you, you, you are all over the place. And that's what happened. Uh, another, uh, I think another factor that we should be concerned with is that I look at writing a constitution as part of the, uh, part of self-determination self also. So it's not only determining your political status and writing the constitution, uh, but both of them are part of self, exercising self-determination. and. When we uh, approach it in this backward manner, constitution first, what we are doing is infringing on the rights of native Virgin Islanders to exercise that fundamental uh, human right, the right of self-determination. Why, why do I say that? Uh, with this approach, anyone who can vote, legally vote in the Virgin Islands, can participate in the uh, in the whether to determine whether to approve the constitution or not, right? Uh, this <laughs> makes it impossible for native Virgin Islanders to exercise the right of self determination because the vote is getting impacted by people. It could be people who just been in been in the territory for for a few months, but they are legal voters, so they can vote. You know, they might be here for a few months. They plan to leave in the next few months, but they can vote and impact, you know, the decision that we are making. So uh, there's no way I can support, you know, writing the constitution before determining our political status. It might be difficult, yes. It might be challenging, yes. But that is a normal course in which you approach, you know, constitution and political status. Thank you, uh, Professor. Now. It, if from, again, listening to what you all are saying is that because we have not determined political status, there are issues of political status that have gotten inserted into the document that discusses how you do your everyday business uh, as, as a government. And, and that is what has been happening. It's, it's been seeping into the writing of the constitution. And there are some questions uh, on political status that have not ever won, won at all in Congress, and that is determining who all can vote and eliminating certain individuals from being able to vote. I, I don't know um, if any group has ever been able to convince the US Congress 
uh, that you can eliminate some groups who are uh, residents of the uh, of, of the territory. But let me ask. Um, um, I, I, I'm going to jump forward and ask um, Senator Barnes and um, and Mr. Emanuel. Uh, clearly, uh, you seem to feel that writing a constitution first will have no effect or, or little effect on uh, on the matter of political status, and you feel that it's critical to have a constitution now, even though we don't have political status. So I will ask you both to address that issue. I defer to the Senator. Thank you, Dr. Molinar, and good afternoon to the listening and viewing audience, and good afternoon to my fellow panelists. You know, I would start with the attempt to adopt a comprehensive land and water use plan. Uh, when I came back from undergrad in 1988, um, Keith Richards and a host of experts um, worked aggressively towards the adoption of a comprehensive land and water use plan. And here we are, I am still trying to move forward with that undertaking. I think we need to recognize at times when the ideal scenario, while it may be practical while it may be ideal it may not be practicable and here we are now again having this discussion um, i feel that it makes sense um, recognizing that we've had five attempts uh, we've had attempts to define um, our political status and those attempts have failed as well what we are proposing with the legislation is to take it to the people and simply ask, one, do you feel that it is prudent to adopt the Revised Organic Act of 1954 to serve as the framework for our constitution? And I believe that this is a good path forward. And we have to remember that we cannot allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. This is not the first attempt at this and what we're trying to say is that several failed attempts have occurred five and so why not start with a document that is governing us anyway a document that we have had input in notwithstanding the fact that it is an act of congress we have had input as it relates to having an elected governor so we have been able to agitate and advocate for certain elements that currently exist in the Revised Organic Act of 1954. But as a people, if we are to evolve and mature politically, we cannot continue with this needing to go to Congress every time we need to make an amendment to the Revised Organic Act of 1954 to govern the manner in which, to make a determination in the manner in which we govern. Most recently, March 27, and we're still dealing with this issue. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. We are now faced with having to conduct the people's business as legislators. And we are now dealing with the issue of where session should be held and what constitutes being present. To have to go to Congress, to have that explained to us, whether remote participation, is equivalent to present. I mean, it, it just speaks to a degree of political immaturity. And I do not believe it is reflective of the collective intellect and psyche of this community. And so I do believe, um, notwithstanding the ideal approach of um, defining status, that in light of everything that we're being confronted with, in light of the fact that we need to be able to determine the relationship of governance and how we interact with government and how we are governed, we should at least begin crafting a document that would speak to that. So I understand the status discussion and I am not um, diminishing the importance, but I think we need to recognize at times that the perfect 
may be the enemy of the good. And at this juncture, um, we do need to make a determination. This will move the needle to me as it relates to self-determination. And so the referendum question on whether to adopt the revised Organic Act of 1954 as our constitution and move forward um, with our portions thereof, to me is a step in the right direction. And it begins to now give us an opportunity to not only frame the question, but move the needle. Because from 1954, um, we've been stagnant and continued stagnation is going to then move to regression. And we need to begin to progress as a people um, to determine at least how we endeavor to be governed. And so I believe, and I am definitely an advocate as I am a proponent of the measure um, that was signed into law to have the referendum question on the ballot um, this November 3rd general election. And I'm encouraging all persons to participate in that referendum question as we begin to move the needle um, to address the issues of self-determination. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emanuel, is there anything you'd like to add to that now? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Molina. I don't disagree with what the proponents of Status First have said, but I agree with Senator Barnes that we need to be more pragmatic. Fact, Virgin Islanders complain frequently about the lack of accountability, corruption, and inability of our elected officials to do what we elected them to do, which is to prioritize and serve the interests of all the people first. So in this thing about whether the chicken comes first or the egg comes first, that's a philosophical discussion for people who want to engage in the intellectual adventure of man. But the reality is that you need to put your own house in order first before you deal with the relationships outside of your house. So any legitimate change in our status will give our local officials much more power and control than they currently possess. One of the reasons people are afraid of dealing with status is because they're afraid of granting more power to our local officials without the requisite accountability. A constitution can provide the necessary safeguards and accountability to the people that a status change requires. Therefore, common sense dictates that creating sufficient accountability and safeguards must precede gaining the increase in power and control which a change in status will bring. Whether the people's complaints are true or false, is it sensible to change our status now with the current structure of government in place? For example, if your child wants more rights and independence from you, but that child consistently demonstrates that he or she is irresponsible and unaccountable, would it be wise to give that child a status with more freedom and authority that would lead to even more irresponsible and unaccountable behavior? It's a, it's a rhetorical question. Our elders would say that changing our status before putting the necessary constitutional safeguards in place will be putting Coco Bay on top of yards. And all the local persons probably understand what I mean. Other wise persons have said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Changing our status without the necessary constitutional safeguards would be giving our government absolute power. Whether we choose free association, independence, or statehood, it doesn't matter. Each of these statuses would create a government with considerable, considerably more autonomy, less accountability, and safe, safeguards than we currently possess. So I contend that we must put the requisite safeguards in place first. Given our history with constitution drafting, adopting the Organic Act, which we can amend in stages, as was mentioned before, is the most sensible and practical way to go. Someone mentioned about foundation and house building, but I'm gonna take it to a different angle. When you build a house, you must not only provide a foundation, but the foundation has to be level and the walls normally have to be plumb or straight. Changing our status now without the necessary constitutional safeguards would be like building a house with a slanted foundation and slanted walls, which would not be able to support the roof correctly. If we think that our elected officials are bad now, Imagine what would happen 
if we gave them more authority and without more accountability. Therefore, I support using the power that we already have, as has been said before, to create this accountability. At this juncture in our history, this is best done by first adopting the Organic Act as our constitution. Next, we would make the necessary amendments to put the safeguards in place that I talked about that will hold government officials more accountable and make it easier than it is now for the people to A, participate in the decision-making processes, B, remove officials that have violated the trust of the people. Currently, these things exist, but it's almost impossible to achieve them based on how the Organic Act is written. This seems to be the most sensible path to prepare for status change. Our wise elders say, you must learn to walk before you're trying to run. If we change our status and grant more power without the necessary safeguards in place, it will be like trying to run before properly preparing your body for the shock and pounding of running. We would be walking into a fire without the proper asbestos protection. Our ancestors also say, hurry dog, eat rock on meal. We must take our time and make the necessary preparations for status change. And finally, once again, addressing status now without the constitutional safeguards for the people will not only be dis disastrous, but, but a lot of people don't want to vote on status because they don't, they're afraid of what extra power would, be give, would do in the hands of the current public officials. So thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you very much. And um, I want to go back to uh, Senator Barnes. Senator Barnes, you had begun to talk about some of the benefits uh, of, of the um, having the changes in the uh, Organic Act, and you, you mentioned uh, the matter of appearing. Are there other benefits that you can identify that, uh, that are currently in the Organic Act that you would want to see changed uh, for the future? Right. Well, again, as uh, Professor Emmanuel indicated, um, a constitution is a document that dictates the relationship between government and the people. So it is important that we recognize, and I agree with him wholeheartedly in terms of putting the cart before the horse, because again, if we adopt this um, revised organic act and begin using it as a framework for our constitution. It will give us um, a degree of flexibility for certain issues that right now we have to go to petition Congress to amend the, the revised organic act. Things like where the governor resides, Based on the, 19, the revised Organic Act of 1954, the governor should be residing in St. Thomas, Congans, Gata. Um, that is not happening. With everything that we're dealing with um, in, in this nation um, as it relates to the global pandemic, do we really have time um, to go to Congress to ask Congress something as simple as where should our governor reside? Um, the revised Organic Act of 1954 states that um, sessions of the legislature should be convened in Charlotte or Mali um, and, and, and a quorum of those of those members present constitute a quorum. Um, the, in 1954, we didn't have internet. We didn't have video teleconferencing. Uh, we also did not have a global pandemic. So do we now have to um, delay doing the people's business in terms of what constitute present um, in this day and age, we have to go to Congress to ask for that. Under the, the interpretation of the language in the revised organic act, that is what we have to do. If we adopted it and had our own constitution, we could make the appropriate amendments in that regard. We're thinking about cannabis legislation. Um, cannabis is illegal on the federal level. Um, we are now um, faced with limitations as to what a cannabis industry can look like in the Virgin Islands based on the limitations of operating under a revised organic act and not having our own constitution. Issues relative to shoreline access, um, issues relative to um, in terms of changing um, the, the, the way, the manner in which we um, deal with representative government. Um, right now, the threshold would require that you have to have a certain percentage of registered voters, which is just a Herculean 
um, threshold to be able to achieve. And we saw that with the most recent initiative. If we had our own constitution, we would be able to make the appropriate amendments that would allow for us to have certain initiatives move forward. So again, it is a governing document. It is a document that would dictate um, to a significant degree the relationship between government and the people. And as the people, we the people, it is important that we have a, a guiding document um, that is our own. And notwithstanding the fact that we have been able to provide input in the Revised Organic Act of 1954, we have evolved and matured as a people. Government has evolved, um, technology has evolved, and we should be able to have the latitude, the, the allowance, the flexibility to amend um, our governing document to keep pace with the real world. And right now, uh, we, are such a, we are at such an infantile um, state that for anything that we need to do, we have to now petition Congress to be able to make changes. So uh, if we cannot wrap our brains around how, how that sounds in terms of self-determination de um, and our level of political maturity, um, I don't know what else would. So I, it, the benefits to me are, are glaring and it just speaks to having a degree of control and autonomy as we make a determination as to how government interacts with we, the people. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Barnes. And so I'm gonna call on uh, Dr. Sekou. Dr. Sekou, you've been hearing the two sides of the argument. What say you? Is Dr. Sekou on? Okay, we'll wait until they bring um, Dr. Sekou uh, on screen and uh, we'll move on to the, um, to the next question. And uh, that is what can we learn about the, from the past constitutions? We heard we have four delegates uh, here uh, of, from the Constitutional Convention, the first Constitutional Convention. And um, so what can we learn from those conventions that could inform moving forward if there is a sixth? And we'll start with uh, Dr. Haptis. Dr. Haptis, you were quite um, a central figure in the fifth Constitutional Convention. Can you share with the viewers what, what you see as the lessons that could be learned from the fifth. Thank you, Dr. Molinar, and uh, thank you to WTJX for this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon to one and all. Uh, isn't it amazing that in this year, 2020, the United States Virgin Islands still does not have a constitution. We're being governed by the revised Organic Act. And this is not good, for we've had five constitutional conventions where we, the people of the Virgin Islands, have tried to write their own constitution. Being a territory of the United States, we could not get approval from the US government. As we review the last uh, constitutional conventions, and I'm, I'm looking at the fourth constitutional convention, which was convened in 1980, and the fifth constitutional convention of which I was a part and which was chartered in 2004, and the delegates elected in 2007, and we submitted our draft in 2009, and we're now in 2020. We are set to repeat the same mistakes unless we review and consider the options that we may have. It's, it's in looking at the May 8th, 2007 Daily News, we saw the following. The purpose of a constitution is to put power in the hands of the territory. You have to remember that with the fourth constitutional convention, the delegates published a study of the Virgin Islands proposed constitution. It was like a teacher's text for grades eight to nine in October of 1981. And it addressed the differences. They included a photo and biographical information of the fourth constitutional convention 
uh, members. Uh, and uh, they continued the 30 delegates of the Fourth Constitutional Convention included full documentation of rules and regulations, as well as conduct and what it should contain. It was published in October of 1981. We're in 2020, but it addressed the differences between the Fourth Constitutional Convention and the Organic Act. I actually have a copy here because I, I really like what it did as we're looking for us from the Fifth Constitutional Convention to put out a publication I spoke with uh, president uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago and again uh, a couple of days ago about it um, because we have so much material and there's no need to just continue to sit on it. Uh, the capital, it included the capital of the VI, the anthem, flag and flower, uh, the, the political subdivisions and committees on local government, citizenship definitions of a Virgin Island and local government, article on the Bill of Rights and the Committee of the Bill of Rights, the judicial branch, the judicial powers and functions, the legislative powers and functions, and education and culture. The Fifth Constitutional Convention passed their draft of a constitution for the U.S. Virgin Islands. However, it was not until a superior court judge ordered that the governor, ordered the governor who said that we had no authority and he rejected the draft and then he sent it to President Obama after the judge ordered him. In February, President Obama forwarded the document to Congress and it was on March 17th before the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans and Wildlife. And the president of the convention, Gerard Liz James, Senator Adelbert Bryan, Professor Gerard Emanuel and myself, along with our attorneys testified on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands. The purpose of a constitution for the territory is really to give power to we, the people. Most importantly, we have to continue to bring people up to date with whatever we are doing to continue the work for a constitution. The people need to be involved and they need to be involved all the time about it, whatever we're working on. I know that we took our meetings out to the communities on all islands. However, we have to educate the people on the Virgin Islands possibilities. And we also have to elect delegates who have the heart of the Virgin Islands people in their best interest and from differing communities who are representative of these, our beautiful Virgin Islands. I love these islands. They've been great to us. We want them also to be great to our children and our grandchildren with all the inalienable rights. Thank you. Great, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Haptis. And I'm looking at the screen and um, I haven't seen our telephone number uh, for calling in. And um, I'm hoping that the WTGX staff will put that up soon. Oh, there it is for your call in questions. Uh, please uh, dial in your questions. You can call that number and they'll take your questions down. And as I indicated, you could also send uh, your questions uh, to, uh, to Facebook. So let me um, ask uh, Professor Emmanuel, uh, what lessons, you, know, you are a member of the fifth, even the secretary of the fifth convention, what lessons do you think we need to, to bring with us from the fifth? While we wait for him to uh, be brought up by WTJX, we'll ask um, Dr. Corbin uh, if he can, um, uh, add to what um, Dr. Haptis just said. What what lessons do you see need to be learned from the fifth? Well, I, I would suggest that um, there are lessons to be learned for all of the attempts to write a constitution uh, dating back to 1964. Um, much of that has to do with the congressional response to it. So we now have a, a revised organic act um, if that transforms to a constitution, there's no doubt that Congress would invariably adopt that uh, and approve that. But anything that we may wish to put in addition to that, um, we may have a, some issues there because of the implications of the previous submissions of constitutions where certain aspects that were referred to earlier 
uh, would, would be um, not considered to be viable. Uh, one of the things that I think in all of the, all of the constitutional submissions um, has to do with the fact that the limitations of territorial status are very clear. Um, so certain things that we would like to do, uh, we could not do. The governor, for example, uh, could not close the airport uh, if, uh, with respect to COVID when people were suggesting that he do so. Uh, because we can't do that under, under the current political status that we have, uh, we, a constitution wouldn't uh, be able to change that if we bring that and put something like that in the constitution then when it goes to Congress, because Congress has to adopt it. Um, so the question is whether or not it is our constitution to begin with, if they can amend it, and the law says that they can. So the question really is about the limitations uh, that exist in, this, in, the, in the relationship that we have. And invariably, a uh, reference was made to um, the fact that we have to go to Congress to, uh, to, to change the Organic Act. Uh, in fact, that may be the most uh, uh, financially viable me method of changing the Organic Act. Because I, if I'm not mistaken, the current legislation would require a uh, constitutional convention, um, which is, there's a cost associated with that. There's a cost associated, and probably the people would have to be elected there's a cost associated with that. So I think in terms of uh, looking at this from uh, uh, that perspective as well, I think we need to try to be uh, practical. We, the reference was made to being practical. That might be the, a most practical way of submitting changes to the Organic Act, which would, while we work on, on developing the broader picture of, of political status. So let me uh, get this clear, uh, Dr. Corbing. Are you saying that if indeed the revised Organic Act were approved by the people, um, would it not mean that you won't need a constitutional convention? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm suggesting that the, I believe the legislation requires it um, for a constitution, uh, requires that it go through a convention. Now, you, that, I'm, I, can, I stand to be corrected, but I believe that's what the legislation says. So in other words, uh, in any case, the document itself would have to go to Congress. And so that if we adopt the exact same thing that exists, then the chances are, yes, we will have a constitution, which would be the, revi the revision of the Revised Organic Act or Revised Organic Act Part 2. Uh, we won't necessarily have added anything to it uh, of substance. Uh, if, in fact, we do that, then we have a possibility that it would not be accepted. And these are the, this is the, um, the, the lesson that we learned from previous arrangements, because we have effect effectively taken the Revised Organic Act and sought to write a constitution within, within the context of the same framework. And some of the things that were attempted to be put in it uh, were, were, not, were rejected. Even the reference to the last and fifth constitutional convention there was a reference to political status in it, recognizing that there's a difference between the two. And this was even uh, one of the issues that the, con the Congress, or partic one particular Congress person, the senator of the, of the committee that uh, addressed the issue, uh, was curiously uh, against that. So I'm wondering what, what that was about. But in any case, we, we do know that in the end, they will have the authority to, uh, to make that decision. Great. Thank you very much for that clarification. And um, now, uh, Dr. Sekou, um, what say ye? Dr. Sekou? Well, uh, good afternoon. First, I'm very pleased with this discussion. I think what I see is that the bottle is half full, not half empty. I think that um, one of your previous uh, discussions mentioned that in the past, um, we voted in November of 1982 that political status be placed first. Uh, and that was a very important referendum. And after that, a select committee was created to make political status an issue. We formed a status commission. And in 1993, there was a referendum on status. And it didn't reach the 50% plus one threshold, but a majority of the people who voted, voted for the territorial option. Uh, since then, we had this fifth uh, constitution convention, constitutional convention, and it didn't quite complete this task. Uh, I think it's wise for us to consider that year 2027 become the year in which we tackle political status. 
That year would be the centennial of the Virgin Islands people acquiring U.S. citizenship. And that should be the year that we uh, truly have a consensus or at least have a majority vote on which way to go. Uh, that's a seven-year uh, plan. And instead, we focus on approving this uh, um, Revised Organic Act, which has been amended and revised for the past 60 years because the Revised Organic Act is, has been amended due to a, uh, a series of laws, a series of um, uh, reforms made that allow us to have an elected governor, uh, a change of uh, senatorial seats. Uh, we've also had a Supreme Court, a judicial branch has developed a reorganization. So it'll be wise for us to consider that this Revised Organic Act be considered a revised act that is revised several times already. Let us consider that as the foundation of a constitution. And I believe if we have an organic act that is revised and modernized, it could take us a step forward. So I think um, this referendum is important. It gives us more uh, autonomy. It gives us one small but meaningful step forward towards self-determination. That's a very interesting idea, Dr. Sekou. Uh, what you're suggesting is that uh, move forward with the organic act and then set up for ourselves a prize uh, in seven years uh, to celebrate our 100 year anniversary. And at that time, complete our political status determination. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, Dr. Molina. And I think one of the one of the bitter lessons I have learned from being an educator on this topic is that a constant criticism is that our people simply do not know the issues are too elevated in academia, too abstract, and our people would love that we can break down these concepts into uh, bite-sized concepts that every single person who lives here, and even Virginians who live abroad in the mainland, they too should be able to participate in the discussion. And the only way you can do that is to give ourselves the time, the focus, the resources to include every single Virgin Islander those at home and abroad, and in fact, infuse it into our curriculum so that our students, our school children, public, private, parochial, can have a chance to weigh in, master the topic, so that this political status issue doesn't, doesn't um, remain this abstract boogeyman, but it's something we can grab, hold on to, master, and make a decision. And in, uh, that's, that's such an interesting idea. And you spend the seven years infusing it yes. into mind Yes. Of, the, of the community. Brilliant yes. idea. Brilliant idea. It sounds like a King Solomon wise <laughs> idea. <laughs> Chopping the baby in half. You know, let's let's keep it whole and do both. I, I would like to ask uh, Senator Jackson. Is Senator Jackson still up on the screen? Um, there have been, Senator Jackson, some of the objections that have been leveled against the Revised Organic Act is that, say, uh, people saying, that this is not something that has been written by Virgin Islanders. It has been handed down to us by the great founding fathers abroad. Uh, <laughs> can you clarify this, please? Well, there's reasons why that is stated. And I, I think several of the panelists have discussed uh, the Organic Act being revised on more than one occasion. Of course, most recently in, in modern history, the right for us to elect our own governor, a unicameral legislature to which uh, Senator Barnes and I and other members of the legislature serve in presently, uh, that we would have a delegate to Congress, even though she's non-voting, which also speaks uh, to our status as a colony of the United States. Uh, when you go back into the history of the Virgin Islands and you see agitators, uh, advocates, like D. Hamilton, Jackson, and St. Croix, and Rachel Francis, and St. Thomas. I don't think many people know the history to which the evolution of the Organic Act, he is considered the father of the language of, uh, for self-government. So he's called the father of the Organic Act. And in 1919, imagine that, a few years after these islands were sold, uh, Francis was sent up. Uh, as a delegate to Washington, D.C., to present the case of the people of these islands relating to self-determination. He wrote the president in 1923, urging the president to act on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands. And we could go on and on. 
So over the years, Virgin Islanders have been actively engaged uh, in uh, aspects of self-government. Now, the, the discussion of the status referendum, and I understand those who support status first, but also Dr. Siku has offered a, a suggestion. Now, that's not a bad one. You know, seven years goes very quickly. We may say, well, that's seven years down the road. Uh, but that's right around the corner. And uh, likewise, we know that over the last 50 years, uh, these islands has transformed over the last 100, but the, especially the last 50. The Organic Act has served as a, a governing document for 66 years. And uh, if you do the math uh, in reference to the Organic Act, uh, the Organic Act uh, from 36 is 94 years. Uh, in reference to when we began of 1936, 94 and 66. So uh, 2027 may not be a bad year, a benchmark. And of course, it took us 10 years from 1917 to 1927 to gain U.S. citizenship. It wasn't granted by the love of the United States for the people of the Virgin Islands. It was granted by agitation by Virgin Islanders demanding for American citizenship, and still we are second-class citizens not able to vote and participate in presidential elections within the territories, whether you are American coming into the territory, or whether you were born here, or whether you naturalize, we don't have that right. Thank you so very much. Okay, I think it's time for us now to look at some of the questions that are coming in on Facebook, uh, Facebook to the WTJX site. Um, this comes from David Silverman. He says, do we know whether Congress will be willing to relinquish its authority? Does anybody have a guess on, on Congress relinquishing its authority? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Uh, relinquish concerning the uh, Constitution? Yes. Well, Congress has repeatedly um, asked the Virgin Islands uh, people to decide on a constitution. In fact, they would be eager that we deal with our local uh, government. Uh, the federal government has no interest in dealing with our local issues. That's our responsibility. Okay, anyone else wants to add to that? Yeah, I would like to add to that. Um, Dr. Seku is so correct. And again, I go back to March 27, you know, um, we're in the midst of a global pandemic um, many members of the 33rd legislature were unable to participate in a very important session remotely, notwithstanding that there was technology um, that would be available for us to do so. And do you think in the midst of a global pandemic that the United States Congress would want to be bothered um, with having to tell the 33rd legislature, yes, your members can vote remotely. Um, so we have to think about the practical, you know, the practicability of the discussion that we're having. And so I do not um, see um, anything else but willingness on the part of Congress to allow us to have some, um, a significant degree of self-governance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this question also from the WTJX Facebook, um, Kasamura Vasara asks, how can one write their own constitution if it has to be approved by Washington? I am not hearing any, anyone speak about human rights of the people to self-determination at all. Could the panelists discuss the UN decolonization resolutions in reference to this topic? I think, you could hear me? Yes, yes, uh, Ms. Adeyemi, yes. I, I think I mentioned that earlier, that, you know, the the UN has, first of all, the UN has, uh, this has been the third decade for the eradication of colonialism, right? You have Resolution 1514, right? And you have Re Resolution 1541. I said before that all people is one of the most essential fundamental human rights. The right 
to determine uh, your political status. You know, we are willing, you know, we can amend the, the organic act have, has been amended before. I, I don't disagree with the senators that there might be a need to, uh, to make some amendment to it. But my suggestion, this is not, this is not the people calling for this. This is a small elite group of senators based on their experiences calling for, you know, some amendment to the Organic Act. I don't have no problem with that. They can get together, look at the various ways they want to amend the uh, revised Organic Act, and then go to Congress and work for those revisions, right? Uh, amendments, if, if all we want to adapt this constitution for so we can have the right to amend the revised organic act. You know, amendments are not something that are made willy-nilly. It takes, you know, it takes a long time. I mean, the ERA is almost what? Almost a hundred years since they've been trying to get the ERA amended to the US constitution. They don't happen willy-nilly, but for we to just uh, just go along with this, uh, this colonial document, go along with this colonial document and ignore our right to exercise our self-determination and writing our own constitution is part of that right of self-determination. It's not only determining the political status, that's the one, the, the first part of it. The second part of it is then you write your constitution and you are talking about the, uh, I was looking at a, uh, a study there by the New York Bar Association Committee and the United Nations. And, and, and they point out, for example, that that, that uh, in almost all instances of decolonization through a United Nations powered uh, approved referendum or other process, the people entitled to vote their future have been limited to those who have been considered the indigenous inhabitants of the territory. Uh, it said the right should be limited to legitimate members of the indigenous group unless they themselves wish to confer this right upon others. I don't have no problem with that. Native Virgin Islanders and people who have lived in the Virgin Islands for quite some time, I'll say maybe 20 years ago, should be able to participate in that process. And the process is determining our political status and then writing a constitution to go along with whatever status we have chosen. Uh, to do that is to outsource, I mean, our fundamental right and, and outsource it to a government that is riddled with systemic racism, right? We know that it's clear. We look at the history of that government, whether you want to look at um, the, uh, when affirmative action was white, when it passed the, you know, the GI Bill and so forth. Uh, if you want to look at the Southern Manifesto, when all those senators and congressmen in response to Brown versus Board of Education uh, decided to, to come up with, you know, a racist document, you know. These are the people that we're going to. Stephen King, you know, still in Congress. These are the people that we are, we are outsourcing this fundamental human right to. So I, I, definitely, uh, I definitely go along with that. The last point I will make is that the reason for the failure of the previous constitutional convention is because, uh, unlike what Gerard said about philosophical argument, is you put in the card before the horse. You have to determine the political status to provide the framework, the boundaries, the parameters, the, the direction that prevents you from going all over the place and coming up with a document that usually the, the vast majority of all people usually uh, cannot approve. I think okay, that's a crucial point, Dr. Muller. Could yes. I respond to that? Emmanuel, yes. yes. I agree with what Dr. Adeyemi is saying, but I think that we have to put this in a proper context. Mm -hmm. The status deals with our relationship with the United States and other countries, like Dr. Corbin said. Right. A constitution deals with our functioning within ourselves. Right. If you go with... I think his uh, screen got um, frozen. Um, Dr. Molinar, uh, yes, what, yes. 
while we wait for uh, Professor Emmanuel, I just wanted to read the question that's going to be on the ballot. Oh, yes, he's back. He's back now. <laughs> right, okay. Yes, sir. in nature, a seed, a seed, everything goes, grows from the inside out. You have to start with yourself first mm -hmm. and get your house in order. We can, I mean, what y'all saying about status is nice, but that's the historical way. We have to look at our specific context. The Virgin Islands isn't like a community that had a bunch of oppression with a united cooperation with a body politic full of nationalism. When we write a constitution now, we have to include things that will unite us as a people. That's right. If we don't unite the Virgin Islands as a people. Status is dead. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, we experienced it. Malik will tell you, it's very hard to get anybody to vote at anything now because they don't have confidence in giving the government any more power. We have to, we have to, tr the people have to trust that we will come up with ways of ensuring that whoever, whoever is in charge when we make a status change is accountable to the people. And I think that Ms. Santa Barnes said it's, it's more diff it's so difficult now to make changes. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some things I think that are important. May I, before I, I, I recognize uh, the next speaker, Okay, I'm sorry. I think, um, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Mr. Emmanuel, you, you really hit it on the head. And if I may just add to what you have said, uh, I, I, respond, I mentioned earlier that discussions uh, that we have in the Virgin Islands tend to conflate a constitution, which is the day-to-day -day running of your government, That's with right. your political status, which is your relationship with the governing power or your independence from that individual. Mm -hmm. the, what we need to be writing is a constitution that is similar to the constitutional documents that you find in New York City, in Maryland, in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in California. Those, are doc those constitutions are state constitutions that describe the court system. It describes um, how you elect your how you elect you, the, your officials. It describes the structure of your legislature. Those are issues, um, what, what, what your educational system is like. Those are day-to-day -day issues in the constitution of the state. We are writing a constitution as a state, quote unquote, on how we are organizing the structure and the function of the government. Political status document, that, that constitution is entirely different. That constitution that determines political status is one in which indeed you will talk about your independence. It will talk about your borders. It will talk about your relationship with other countries. It will talk about the rights of your citizens. So they are two entirely different documents. And if we continue to conflate the two, we will always be confused. And listening to this discussion today and the question that was just asked, I see that that mix up is there. We have to remove them. We have to talk about what we're doing on every day and as apart from how we're going to relate to everybody else in the world. So having said that, uh, who wants to be the next speaker? Okay, let me ask one of the questions that came in, um, she says um, she likes what Dr. Um, this is from WTJX Facebook. She likes what Dr. Seifu is suggesting. And um, how can we ensure that the constitutional draft that we sent this time around will be passed and contain no language that the US will consider xenophobic? This is come from Jazelia. SJ on Facebook. Uh, can I answer? Yes, yes. I, I believe in the rule uh, that one truth crushes a thousand lies. I think we need to engage in a very honest, open discussion on these issues. I think in the past we got derailed because we allow um, untruths to be said and believed. I believe that Virgin Islands people, once they understand the fundamental concepts, they will vote in their own self-interest. I think the challenge is to make sure the information is understood. In fact, Dr. Paul Leary has proposed that he and I, and I think also an attorney, uh, Yvonne Topps, work on a document 
that breaks down the revised organic act into plain english and and when we explain even using saint thomas creole or saint croix creole break down these concepts so all of us understand what is in front of us and and i was i want to emphasize this constitution is not a final document in essence it is an interim document because in seven years if we decide to take a political status option that goes a different direction we'll change it again but we need to we need to agree that our existing organic act needs to become a constitution, at least for the meantime, because it gives us the power to decide what's in our best interest as a people. Without having to go to Congress. That's correct. Without, Without having, having to go to Congress. And right. that, is, that is the key point that you want to make. Uh, there's a very uh, interesting question that came forward. Um, the question was, uh, since uh, Senator Jackson and Senator Barnes are going to not be returning to the for the 34th legislature and since this referendum is not binding how can we ensure that it will move forward i i like to respond and i <laughs> as you are well aware there are other members of the legislative body who i trust would be returning who also had legislation senator Bailey, senator Farrell. Uh, I think some of the Britons also um, may have had uh, some draft legislation, myself, and, and, and probably a couple others relating to uh, status and the Constitution. So we are certain that the process will continue when there has been a commitment from the members of the 33rd legislature to see this too. Of course, the people of the territory also to be in and to make sure that the political leaders are addressing, because as Dr. Hapi stated, it's an ongoing process. And if we are stagnant and the discussion of our future as a people and our future status and self-determination, it will be stagnated with the myriad of issues that we have to resolve and to address on a daily basis, status comes very low, constitution comes very low. Some feel like, you know, this is being pushed down the throat, but 66 years, 90, um, six plus years later, um, that we are still having this discussion regarding a working document. And yes, I hear the good professor stating, and I would agree with Dr. Uh, Molina, that we're talking about two different processes. We're talking about the inner workings of a document that governs our day-to-day -day affairs in our status as it relates to the United States of America, and that this may be the means to progress and to achieve the ultimate goal, because we've been kicking this can down the road, and ultimately we can say, well, it may, if it takes 50 years for us to determine status, then so be it. But we feel that this is a process that we can swallow that tail and still at the same time educate our people through the importance of self-determination. Yes, we, we must what assess we want. them as two separate documents. Um, Dr. Senator Barnes? Y yes, I, I would like to add that this process is participatory That's and great. one of the problems that we have in this territory is that we feel that we simply vote for someone go home come back in the next two or four years and then vote again either out of satisfaction or frustration <laughs> we have to ensure we the people that we remain actively engaged we are in the midst of a, a re-election cycle or election cycle. The elector has to pose these questions to those persons who are presenting themselves as wanting to represent them. This has to be a question that is asked. And this has to remain a priority on the collective psyche of the electorate. And the problem that we continue to have in this territory is that we elect individuals go home and feel that 
solve every problem, do everything for us. We'll be satisfied, we'll re-elect you, or dissatisfied, and out of frustration, reject you. But this has to be a participatory process. And we, the people, we have to remain actively engaged. So whether Senator Jackson or myself, who are proponents of this, are not going to be in the 34th legislature, the people remain. And we have to insist that this remain a priority, just as a matter of national pride, to determine how we are going to govern ourselves and the relationship that we endeavor to have with our government. Great, thank it's you. And ask one quick one because I, I want to get down to asking this one question, which I think is a very interesting one, which was, why can't we just use the fifth constitutional document, remove the unacceptable parts, and come, or maybe combine it with the Vice Organic Act and send that off? That, that no, no one is saying that we can't. And the thing is, I wanted to read the question because the question on the ballot, because someone is stating that this is being rammed down the people's throat or this is an elite group of elected officials. The question on the ballot, the question says, are you in favor of adopting the, the revised Organic Act of 1954 or portions thereof as, a, as the USVI Constitution. So basically it affords the opportunity to do a myriad of things just simply using the Revised Organic Act of 1954 as the framework, as the governing document that we're going to work from. So basically nothing precludes us um, from doing what is being recommended um, by the individual who asked the question. So mm -hmm. there's this opportunity for portions of the fifth document that could be inserted there uh, in that. That's, uh, that's really interesting. very interesting. So, Dr. Hapti, did I see your hand up? I wasn't sure that I saw Oh, no, that. no, I was just I just, was just mentioning that it's two different documents, but if we're going to look at the revised organic act, that's a good place to... Um, to begin because it definitely incorporates all of the aspects that the people, um, you know, wanted to approve. So that works. Great. Okay. Uh, let me see if there are any further um, questions that wanted to go. Oh yes. Someone asked, and if you could make this as uh, succinct as possible, what is the success of the other territories in, I want to uh, indicate, um, Um, I wanted to uh, make sure that I'm getting this from <laughs> from the um, from I'm trying to search for the correct uh, for the correct uh, status. Uh, this is from Adelbert Bryan. He says, "Is the Constitution going to be written by the people from Mass Naturalization Act of 1927, or the people that came after this time?" Again, this is asking a question regarding a political status question versus a question directed toward the day-to-day -to -day running of the of the of the uh, of the of the territories. Again, I think we are looking to have, as as Dr. Sekou suggested, two separate documents: one about political status, our relationship with the with the with the U.S. or lack thereof. And that would be an appropriate question for that, those seven years that Dr. Sekou suggested uh, during that period of time. Uh, so um, I think that, that probably uh, answers that. Um, oh yes, uh, here's someone who wanted to know, what, has the, what about the, all the other territories? Do they have a constitution? Is it only Guam and the Virgin Islands without the constitution? Can I can I take a stab at it and let Dr. Corbin get yes, that? Yeah, cool. I'm gonna let Dr. Corbin deal with the difficult part of the question. <laughs> uh, the challenge that Guam and the Virgins um, have is the identity issue, and uh, I think that we will be able to do justice to our situation 
if we at minimum see this revised organic act referendum as a step in a practical uh, and meaningful way towards our autonomy and governance and separate that from political status. In Guam's case, Guam has a Chamorro uh, indigenous ethnic group that somewhat sounds like our situation, but they're a bit different. And I think they, they've had a, a difficulty with having the political status and constitutional issues combined. And so when we separate the issues, they allow us to deal with one issue first and the second issue second. Okay, great. Dr. Corbin, did you want to add to that in any way? Yeah, to just a brief, um, brief, a brief a summary points, because I know you um, have lots of information that you can give. Guam has um, rejected its constitution, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in 1979, on the basis that it didn't meet their needs. Um, they currently are involved with the Political Status Commission on decolonization. They tried, they attempted to do a commonwealth status early on, but Congress rejected it because they saw that it was too much power within the framework of a territory. Uh, so now the issue is a referendum on political status between independence, free association, or statehood. Uh, very similar in the case of Puerto Rico, which has a constitution, but clearly the constitution is uh, not considered to be sufficient to provide them with the full measure of self-government, which is what the United Nations Charter requires. And so all of that we are discussing today is, with, is within the framework of achieving the full measure of self-government, and that is at the end, whenever that may be, in regards to developing a, a status, not to accept necessarily the current status, which is not a full measure of self-government, but rather one of the, the three options that gives us that full measure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And so what I'm going to do now is ask um, the last question. And um, uh, I would like to start with uh, Mr. I I Adeyemi. Mr. Adeyemi, how yes. would you summarize what you have heard today regarding <laughs> a no vote for the referendum or what are your own personal thoughts on a no vote? So you have, <laughs> we give you the time that we have. What, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, I'm definitely for a no vote on the referendum uh, for several different reasons. One, I want to, I agree with uh, the panelists that a political status and referendum are two different things but they are very much related, you know, political status informed and impacts the constitution. Because for, if you take the revised organic act, you know, our senators cannot amend it. Why? Because of the status, the colonial status prevents that from happening for the most part. So if you had a different status, right, you probably would have been able to amend that amend that constitution. So they are related, they're impacted, they're related. In terms of, uh, I think someone mentioned Puerto Rico. One, co another concern, I have several concerns, but another concern I have is that, you know, Puerto Rico wrote a constitution around 1952, approved it, right? After they wrote that constitution, went to the United States Congress, Congress amended it, amended it in, a, in, in, in ways that really compromise the, the authority of the Puerto Rican people, and they didn't go back to the Puerto Rican people for approval. But after Congress amended it, the United, the United States went to the United Nations and got the United Nations to vote and approve it and argue that because they have written the Constitution, they are no long, they should no longer be on the list of non self governing territories. And Puerto Rico was removed from the list of non self governing territories in the United Nations. Uh, this possibly can happen to us. This can happen to us in, in writing this constitution, you know. But, but I think, uh, importantly, also, someone talked about uh, this being a participatory process as opposed to just uh, the politicians who would like to be able to uh, would like to be able to uh, make or exercise certain decisions 
without having to go to Congress to get the Organic Act amended, right? That's basically what it is for the most part. The people are not involved, you know. Very recently, Cuba revised their constitution, right? It was a participatory democratic process. Mm -hmm. Over 9 million people participated. They had hundreds of thousands of meetings at educational centers, high school, universities, in neighborhoods, in workplaces. And as a result of the people's consultation and participation in the revising and drafting of their constitution in Cuba very recently, over 60% 60, 60 of the content of the previous Cuban constitution, the constitution of 1976, which they were revising, 60% of the content was modified and changed. Over 11 articles were dropped. Uh, other articles were amended. Items were deleted from the previous constitution based on the, the people's consultation, the people's participation in that process. What we are doing here, we are simply asking people to vote yes or no to, um, to uh, embrace the revised organic act as our constitution. We are asking our people, no, hey, hey, this is the disrespect to our people. We are asking our people to vote, but there's no education at all surrounding this. What are the implications, ramifications? How does this impact, affect uh, your right of self-determination and support? There's no kind of education, but you're asking people to vote. Uh, and so, because of all those reasons and more, I definitely will oppose um, oppose this referendum in terms of uh, people voting to approve the revised organic act as our constitution. And I still remain to say that it's a, it, it continues to be a colonial document. And after after if you vote to uh, approve it, you still gonna have to go to Congress. Congress still gonna have to have some say on it. They can still make changes or whatnot. And that's the other thing. And then the last point I'll make is that when you look at the uh, when you look at the bill for the um, with regards to this embracing this uh, revised organic act, uh, there are some things that are not clear, right? Because it says, for example, an act for providing for referendum vote and convening a constitutional convention to consider adopting the revised organic act of the Virginia or portions of it as a constitution of the Virginians. Now suppose you adopt portions of it. Uh, that's not clear. What does that mean? You adopt portions, what you're gonna do? You're gonna add portions to the portion that you adopt. So there's a lack of clarity surrounding the proposal also. And so therefore I am, you know, I am opposed to opposed to you know voting in favor of this. Okay, thank you for your comment. And I will ask the same question to um, the senators who are the proponents of the bill. I think you may want to address some of the points of uh, Mr. Adeyemi. So, Senator Barnes or Senator Jackson, how would you summarize what you heard today regarding the yes vote and what are your thoughts on a yes vote? Which one would, who would like to go first, Senator Barnes or <laughs> Senator Jackson? Yeah, I, I, I have. I have no problems if, if that's okay with Senator Jackson. Should I proceed, Senator Jackson? You know, the question is an act providing for a referendum on convening a constitutional convention to consider adopting the revised organic act of the Virgin Islands or portions of it as the constitution of the Virgin Islands. You know, we have to be clear with what we're asking. We are simply going to the people. So it is a participatory process. This is not a process that is being um, promoted by an elite set of elected officials. It is a question to the people. Are you in favor? of adopting the Revised Organic Act of 1954 or portions thereof as a USVI constitution. Because if we are honest, it has been 
de facto USVI constitution since 1954. And if you're okay with that, vote no. If you are okay um, with just remaining as is, without taking any step towards moving towards a degree of self-determination, simply vote no. Simply say, I like things as they are. I'm fine. I'm satisfied with our system of representation. I'm satisfied with having to go to Congress every time, every time we need to determine how we self-govern. I'm satisfied with the lack of political maturity um, in this territory. Just simply vote no. But if you want to see us move towards some degree of self-determination, if you want to see us move the needle in at least beginning to address the relationship between government and we, the people, simply vote yes. I am, I am a proponent of the yes vote. Let us adopt the revised Organic Act of 1954, and notwithstanding the fact that it is an act of Congress, we have had significant input as a people in the document that is presently governing us. Let us adopt it and let us move forward with a constitutional convention to make a determination as to the portions that we would adopt and as we use it as the foundation to craft a USVI constitution. All of the, the wanting the perfect to be the enemy of the good has gotten us exactly where we are today. Nowhere fast. A document that is antiquated and outdated. And as many persons may say, colonial to a significant degree. So if we want to move forward, let us begin with this document that is a de facto USVI constitution anyway, and begin the process of um, revising and revisions and amending to make it relevant to the needs of we, the people today. So again, let us not allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Let us let history be our teacher. And, and what I want to say finally is that when we're making comparisons, whether it be it Cuba or any other um, island nation or any other jurisdiction. We have to ensure that we're making comparisons apples to apples and not apples to oranges. And so the idealism and the, the, the perfect scenario that we are endeavoring to be able to operate within is unrealistic. It does not exist. The United States Virgin Islands is America in the Caribbean and we have a melting pot. And so we need to now be aware and be mindful that we're not going to have the scenarios of some of our neighboring Caribbean islands. But if we want to have some degree of self-determination and really have a say in how we the people interact with our government, I am encouraging first and foremost to participate in the general election, participate in the referendum question, and vote yes as we move the needle towards self-determination. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Barnes. I'm sure Dr. Corbin <laughs> will be able, not Dr. Corbin, uh, Dr. Deku, who would be able to, be, to make a, a similar statement, uh, Mr. Adem, Ademaya, yes. regarding um, education. Um, yes. He ran a, a, a vigorous program and um, and still, there are people he, he could not get the he could not generate the uh, involvement of the community as people in Cuba and people in Puerto Rico. And part of the difficulty I think has to do with um, an issue that was brought by Senator Barnes that people look to their um, political leaders for direction That's and right. and and to who will gather them in. In Puerto Rico, there was a time when you asked somebody, "Good, tell them good morning and how are you doing." The, it immediately they responded in terms of status. And <laughs> so, uh, you you 
had the Puerto Ricans so passionately involved in the question of status, uh, that was never so for the Virgin Islands. We have never had our political leaders as actively involved in the question of status as you have described, uh, Professor Adeyemi, in Cuba and what we have seen in Puerto Rico. So we have to lay some of the, some of the blame on our political leaders. And I, I agree with you, uh, Senator Barnes, that uh, voters need to go out and ask individuals who are running for political office about these particular issues. The League of Women Voters just completed our Meet the Candidates Forum. And on every one of our programs, we ask every single candidate for the position of, sec of, of uh, Senator that same question. Um, I see that Dr. Sewer was just brought back in on the screen. Dr. Sewer, is there anything you wanted to add to this discussion? We're coming down close to the end, so I will ask you if you could um, make a brief uh, statement. What is your summary statement that you'd like to leave uh, the viewers with? Yes, thank you, Dr. Molinar. One of the things that I, would like that is that I think it's quite exciting, actually, that we have the opportunity in this upcoming referendum to address this question of constitutional development. However, in my final or concluding remarks, I would still like to for us to consider that prioritizing constitution at this time could actually lead to a certain level of confusion in our political discourse. And so with that being said, I think there's an extent to which we are asking ourselves to dress with a certain level of maturity that's not actually commensurate with our current condition. And when we look at the revised organic Virgin Islands, and then we look at the process of adopting the Revised Organic Act as our proposed constitution, it is still unclear whether Congress will approve any significant amendments in the ratification process that might actually produce some of the benefits that we are hoping to see with the adoption of the constitution at this particular time. And so I think that some of the conflation that's happening around the benefits of status versus the benefits of constitution aren't simply happening in the minds of the public, but are actually rooted in some of the colonial frameworks that are inherent in the process itself. And so with that being said, I actually think that Dr. Sakim Kabul is a very incredible solution for us by proposing a target of 2027 as a date for addressing the issue of political status. And ultimately, I think that constitutions should really be documents that are determined by the people of a particular body politic in terms of their desire for what they hope to see for the people of the state or the nation of the territory. And I hope that we will not circumvent giving the people of the Virgin Islands the adequate opportunity to not only be educated, but to make an informed decision about our political status, but also how our constitution will govern our day-to-day -day reality. And so ultimately, I think even when we look at this question of the Virgin Islands being America in the Caribbean, quote unquote, I would argue that that's still a somewhat contentious stance for many Virgin Islanders who are still grappling with the question of, is this America in the Caribbean? Or is this an occupied American territory in the Caribbean? And how exactly do our differing positions about our relationship to our federal government dictate our understanding of who we are and how it is exactly that we would like to move forward? And so with that being said, I hope that our process will encourage you know, participation, especially from all segments of our society. But I also hope that we will move forward in a way that allows us to actually grapple with some of the more difficult conversations around constitutional development and to actually push back at the notion that there may be a certain common sense and inevitability surrounding our colonial condition at this time. Great. Well, thank you so very much. That's a, that's a great, great summary. Uh, 
we've we have, we've come down really to the uh, to the end of our program, and the two hours went so quickly. Uh, the time passes when you're having fun, and I want to thank our panelists. I, I think you'll agree with me that they are a blue ribbon panel, and. Um, some people ask when, when when I made the list, I said, oh, this is an elite panel. Just because I'm learning. Please, 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 let's stop that. Let's stop being anti-intellectual. That's happening too much in the mainland. We are better than that in the Virgin Islands. Uh, we appreciate intelligence. Uh, we appreciate learning. And so the League of Women Voters was looking for just that. Um, I want to thank our specialists, our panelists for a stimulating and absolutely informative session. Senator Myron Jackson, thank you. Senator Alicia Barnes, thank you. The sponsors and co-sponsors uh, of the bill. Uh, Mr. Sele Adeyemi, I want to thank you also. Uh, Dr. Lois Haptis for your information. Dr. Carlisle Corbin, I know that you're going to go back and try and get some rest because you are <laughs> probably halfway into tomorrow. <laughs> Professor uh, Gerard Emanuel, uh, Dr. Malik Sekou, Dr. Hadiya Sewer. I, I told you that they are blue ribbon. They definitely are. We also want to thank the incredible WTJX staff and for our league members for assisting with the calls and the posts that, that the public makes. The League wants to thank all who are watching and participating. This program is being taped and it will be replayed on September 26th as well as October 11th, around the same time of day. And it will be seen on the uh, WTGX YouTube and Facebook. Look for more forums. We'll be coming back to the radio. We'll be on TV uh, talking about the referendum. And then in November, vote. Look, the future of the territory depends on your vote, your informed vote. A vote is your voice, it's your choice. I'm Gwen Marie Molinar of the League of Women Voters. Thank you for watching and be a responsible citizen, vote. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of WTJX, its board, staff, or underwriters. This program was underwritten in part by... CautionList is a proud supporter of the Virgin Islands public broadcasting system. They currently have over 200 employees between St. Thomas and St. Croix and have been part of the local community for over 20 years. CautionList carries perishables, groceries, and general merchandise. For more information, visit their website at costyless.com. Market Square East, St. Thomas, and Sign Farm, St. Croix. AARP, Virgin Islands. VINGN is a proud supporter of this League of Women Voters program. VINGN interconnects the U.S. Virgin Islands and connects the VI to the world with fiber optics. Find out more at VINGN.com. And viewers like you.